Good morning, church. Welcome to this worship. We're so happy you've joined us this day. We are Medina United Church of Christ Congregational. We've been welcoming, loving, and serving for 203 years here on the square. We hope you find a warm welcome, a little love, and a way to serve through your time with us. Whether you are live or live stream, welcome. Blessings to all. We begin a new worship series here this Eastertide, The Faces of Jesus. We'll explore images of our Savior found in art and creeds of the church. We'll explore maybe how we imagine Jesus, and maybe, just maybe, risk seeing him in a new way. Maybe here, maybe in our neighbor, and more radically, in ourselves. We have also had the chance to see Christ in our children, as many of them are present and present their Bible projects for their friends, the third and fourth grade Bibles. What a day! Yay! <laughs> the children shall lead us. Friends, we might all picture Jesus differently. We might use different words to describe him, yet his peace pervades and transcends all of our understanding. Let us raise a mighty sign of peace to one another and say, Hey, neighbor, hey, neighbor. glad you're here. Peace be with you. Let us rise in body or spirit and sing our opening Join me in the creedal confessions. We think, of, we think of the creeds as something councils have declared, yet the Bible has many declaratory affirmations. The Shema found in Deuteronomy is the cornerstone of the Jewish faith and a major confession of belief. Hear, O Israel, it's one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The Christian scriptures record Jesus echoing this as the greatest commandment. Yet there are other Christological confessions, like this one found in Mark chapter 8, verse 9. And he asked them, And Peter answered him, 
There are many more creeds and statements of belief in the Bible, but we shall end with Paul giving us a confession from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we exist. Amen.
I invite all the kids to come up front here. Um, Bible kids, you can come up here with me. S sit up here at the top. Bible kids. The rest of us will sit on the steps. You guys can sit up the steps. Good morning. So today is a special day for these big kids up here sitting with me. Today they get their Bibles. They've been working since January, learning about the Bible, doing a little workbook, playing games, and then they had to end with they picked a Bible story or a Bible character that they wanted to learn more about, and they had to do a project. And they presented the projects last week to their Bible sponsors and their families and to me and Pastor Luke. And then today, some of them would like to share them with you before they get their Bibles. Okay, so I'm going to ask if any of them want to share. So you're going to listen to them today, all right, and some of the things that they did. So, Sam, do you want to go first? Are you, okay, all right. So I'm going to hand it over. So Sam, like, introduce yourself and tell what you did. Do you need me to hold it? I can be your Vanna. Okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Sam Linden, and I am reading original poetry called Jonah and the Fish. God told someone to preach at Nineveh. His name was Jonah. He was scared of what he had to do and said, nah. Jonah ran to hide in a ship. Then God let his slash her anger slip. Splish, splash, lightning flash. The crew was afraid as the ship swayed. The captain said, Jonah, you have to go before we're in our graves. So they threw Jonah over and into the waves. God was like, yo, sorry, friend. So God got a big fish that God could send. God sent the fish down from the sky. It ate Jonah up like a big French fry. <laughs> Jonah sat in the fish's belly for three days and nights. And after a while, he came into his sights. I'm sorry, Lord, Jonah cried and prayed. God was happy and quite swayed. So God made the fish throw Jonah up. Will you do my quest now? God asked. Jonah said, yep. So Jonah went to Nineveh and did his quest, and he told the townsfolk, God's way is best. And that's the story of Jonah and the fish. Also, please just follow God's command and wish. Cam, didn't you want to go next? Here, I can hold this and you can hold the microphone. My name is Camden Cochran. I did. My name is Camden Cochran. I did Noah's Ark. My name is Noah was a great man, but the other people didn't care about God or be afraid of him. So God said to Noah, build a ark. So Noah did. Then the f Genesis seven seventeen. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days and fourteen nights. Increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. <coughs> It rained for those thirty days, those forty days and forty nights. Genesis nine sixteen. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Bobby? Awesome. You want me to read it while you, you may hold it while you read? Yeah. Okay. You want to hear this? Hello, my name is Bobby Nolan and I did David and Goliath. 
This is David. He's an Israelite shepherd. This is Goliath. He's a Philistine champion. Goliath thought no one could beat him in battle. Why don't you losers come fight me? The soldiers of Israel were too scared to fight Goliath. No, nah, yeah, no, I'm good, no way. <laughs> David was not a soldier, but he wanted to fight. I will fight you. David picked five rocks from the riverbed to use on Goliath. Ooh, that one's a real beauty. <laughs> David was ready. Are you sure you want to give your life for nothing? You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David fired his sling, and the rock hit Goliath on the ed, um, head. Ow! Wow. <laughs> Goliath fell, and, Dave, and David killed Goliath with, with his own sword. I think this Bible story is important because David had faith in God. So that is why he could defeat Goliath. Nice job. Anybody else want to go? You do, Evelyn. In a few years, you're going to be able to. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. There we go. Mason, you want to do it? All right, buddy. Come over here with me. Uh, I did the, I'm Mason, and I did the story of David and Goliath. Yeah. Uh, who? David was a shepherd and one of Jesse's three, eight sons. One day, his dad sent him to give food to his three oldest brothers who were soldiers in the war against the Philistines. Then when he got there, he heard Goliath taunting the army by saying they were being cowards. Who? Goliath was a giant and a soldier for the Philistines. His height was six cubits in a span, which is equal to nine feet and nine inches. He had a coat of mail and a helmet of bronze. Every day he came out and said, Give me a man so that we may fight together. But none of the Israelites were brave enough to fight him. What happened? David heard that a giant was tormenting people and offered to fight him. And Saul said he was not able to fight him because he was a boy and Goliath was a warrior. David tells him that he has killed lions and bears to protect his sheep and says, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. The battle. Saul tried to give David his armor and sword, but it was too big, and David couldn't walk. Instead, David took five smooth stones from the river and put them in his pouch. When Goliath saw him, he said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Then David said, This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Then, Goliath, then David took a stone from his pouch and slung it at Goliath and hit him in the forehead. Goliath fell forward and died. Then when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. What is it? The story of David and Goliath is all about bravery because even though David had no armor and only a slingshot, he knew that God would help him and that the Israelites, him and the Israelites, and he defeated Goliath. Blake Cook, and I'm going to tell you about how the disciples, well, no, how Jesus showed the disciples how to be faithful and prayer. And prayer. Herod makes a terrible decision and has John the Baptist killed in prison. 
This is devastating news for Jesus. John was his friend and his relative, Matthew 14, 9, 12. Jesus went to be alone to pray with God after hearing the news about John. He was followed even though he was on he was on a boat. Many followed him by foot. Matthew 14, 13. Jesus went to feed 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and two fish, showing the disciples that being faithful, that God would provide for all. Matthew 14, 17, dash 20. Jesus sent the disciples ahead by boat to Genesaret while he sent the crowds of people he healed, talked to, and broke bread with. He went to a quiet place in the mountains to pray. He must have still been grieving for his friend John. Matthew 14, 22, 23. Jesus appeared to the disciples like a ghost, and at first they were frightened by seeing him walk on water toward them. Then Peter realized that it was Jesus, and he said to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus told Peter to come, but as the wind picked up, Peter became frightened and started to sink. But instead of trying to swim back to the boat, he faithfully reached for Jesus and said, Lord, save me. Jesus showed how to be faithful with his actions, like praying and trusting God, what he could do spread it everywhere, and people would come seek his healing however they could. You, you guys have something? In a couple years you might. I know. So here's what we're gonna do. You guys ready? Here's what we're gonna do. Things are a little different today. We are going to go downstairs, but not right this second, because I'm going to send you back with mom and dad for just a minute, because I want you guys to see the kids get their Bibles, and then we'll go downstairs, okay? So right now, go find mom and dad. You guys go sit with your Bible sponsors. Leave your stuff up here, and then we'll go down in a minute. So we'll gather our joys and concerns first, and then we'll invite the kids and their mentors up, and we'll pray over them, say the Lord's Prayer together as the church, and the kids will go downstairs to celebrate. What a big achievement. Super cool. So we lift up our joys and concerns and everything in between. The list is long, so if you have any additional, please see me after service. We lift up Randy Rice, Brad Rice's brother, who had stage four cancer. The CAT scan shows that the brain tumors are gone and the lung tumor has shrunk. So he's trending well, but still must continue down the path of chemotherapy. We lift up Birch Hall and Sharon Danko, both who are going to join, it looks like, the 30% who go on the vent and come off after a good while. So we give praise and thanksgiving for that. Birch is going to regular rehab, and while Sharon is still in the hospital, she is improving. We lift up Jake Worksig, who is the 16-year-old who fell at Whip's Ledges with a traumatic brain injury. He is the friend of our custodian, Sharon Perry, and his son. Courthouse Pizza held a fundraiser that raised funds for this family as much needed because the only hospital that treats traumatic brain injuries of this size and capacity is uh, out of their insurance network. So this family is going to need a lot of help. We lift up David Welch, who has open heart surgery, has been in the ICU for 30 days and has a long road ahead of them. For Hope Wilder, whose health is declining. We lift up Shirley Kirchmar's friend Ruth, who was diagnosed recently with colon cancer. For Kim Bober, who has stomach cancer, employee and friend of the Ingrams. For Tom Cleaver, a friend of Bob Fodor, who has health concerns. We lift up Val, Val Servanek's dad, who has pneumonia, but is recovering at home, and Rob Servanek's dad, who fell. In the headlines and the news, we lift up the pinwheel walk happening later this afternoon around the square, which will end at the library, and we'll be planning 
696 pinwheels at the library in light of the 696 cases of child abuse here in Medina County. This may sound like a big number. It is a big number. One is too many. However, the good news is that now things are being reported thanks to our intrepid teachers and mandated reporters who see these signs and are able to get the help they need. And we have the Children's Center, which is an amazing resource, not just for our county, but statewide. So we give thanks for that. We lift up the LGBT laws in Florida and Ohio that is not welcoming or loving and serves only the fearful. So we, as a church that stands for welcoming, loving, and serving, speak out against those laws. We also pray for peace in Ukraine, peace in our own country with a rash of mass shootings, and on the back of your bulletin, the anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. We lift up prayers and witness against and in memory for those lives lost. But all is not dim, even with all of these swirling in our hearts. The sun is out. It is 80 degrees. It is too hot to wear a robe today. So thank you for your permission, <laughs> forgiveness. We lift up our birthdays as well. For Joan Walshen, Kelly Wassell, for Matt Rubino, Sophie Alver, Eliza Morgan, Catherine Marshall, Kathy Root, for Melissa Billiken, Logan Allen, for Sid Benson and Bailey Olin, for Ken Smith and Ann Usher, Ian White and Adeline Magram. Our lovebirds this week are Barry and Stephanie Spence, Ralph and Mary Beth Goodwin, Debbie and Eric Kelts. The flowers are in honor of Beth and Craig Harry's parents. We lift up that uh, Claire, who we've been praying for, the five-year-old diagnosed with chemo, uh, with uh, cancer, is done with chemo, as is Emmett Novak, who is in remission at the age of five from liver cancer. We lift up Greg Schaefer, who finished with radiation and treatments, but has another two-year round of chemo. We lift up our mission team, and for you, church, we wanted to raise $2,000 for Habitat. You raised $2,835 for Habitat. That's amazing. You worked on the site here. The site is a flagship site, which is uh, more uh, ADA friendly with wider doorways and more accessible ways. So we got the big chief muckety mucks from Habitat coming here to check out work you all helped and sponsored. We lift up the closing of my doctorate. I thank Kate, she does not thank me, but I am thankful for her for helping me proof this monstrosity. Two more, three more days before the next draft is due, I hope to present on May 16th and graduate on May 21st and put this behind me. So prayers in the next few days would be appreciated, as well as prayers for our Bible third and fourth graders. We've waited a year for this, so we give thanks for the mentors, for all who have made this journey, and may it just be the start of your lifelong wrestling, joy, and questioning of our sacred stories. There is so much in there I get super excited about, but I'm going to try to be cool, trying to not be such a Bible nerd, and I love it, and I encourage your Bible geekery from this point forward and for those children to come we look forward to your time with us and Miss Stacy, so we can come to this day and this presentation of our sacred stories that have been passed down over the eons to you in this moment. And so we present this Bible to Madeline Bauer and to Rosie. Let's, let's get both of you here. Whose name is this? What's your name? Madeline, this is your Bible. May grace and peace be yours, and let's take you right there. And who's, who's your sponsor? Miss Amy, thank you for your walk. For Grant Bixler, whose name is this, sir? That's yours. And who is your sponsor? 
Mr. Matt Yates. Thank you, Matt. Camden. Whose name is that? Mine. That's yours. And who was your sponsor? Your mom was your sponsor. Yay, thank you. Blake. Whose name is this, sir? That is yours. This is your Bible, my friend. And who was your sponsor? Your mom, Miss Nikki Cook. Thank you. Sam, <laughs> whose name is this? Yours. This is your Bible. Thank you. And who was your sponsor? Miss Julie. Julie Gilliland. Thank you, Miss Julie. Laura Medley, whose name is this? No idea. No idea. It, it might be your name. And who was your sponsor? Miss Ellen Nolan. Thank you, Ellen. Robert Ford, whose name is this? Who knows? This is also your Bible. Spoiler alert. And who is your sponsor? Miss Katie. Katie Medley. Thank you, Miss Katie. Mason. I like that middle name. That's a very nice middle name. Is this yours? Mason Luke. Okay, we'll have to get the next one. I found it. It's right here. Yay. And who was your sponsor? Your parents. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Rosniak. Charlie Welday, my friend. This is your name. This is your Bible. Thank you for your journey. Who was your sponsor? Miss Sherry Ingram. Thank you, Miss Sherry. And Hannah. Hannah, whose name is this? This is yours. Thank you for your work. And who was your sponsor? Your grandma. Thank you, grandma. Let us go front and center right here, friends, as we'll pray over you. Just moving you around all over the place. Yes. Church, this isn't just your future. This is your very real present. And friends, if you have any questions, you can look out and ask any of these folks right here. And they, are, might, they might say, I don't know. And that's okay. That's an answer. And you might have an insight from your Bible subject, your Bible project. So any of you who have questions can ask them. That's how this thing works. Bible is read in community, and this is where we find meaning. So thank you, sponsors. Thank you, church. Thank you, readers, for this day and for many more to come. Let us pray with one another in the spirit of prayer. Thank you, God, for your church, for your sacred stories passed down, transcribed, and given to us to wrestle with, to find meaning and direction, to say, nah, friend, and to revel in and be in community around. We give you thanks for these young scholars and for their mentors every step of the way, learning from the community here. Thank you for this church to provide the space, the wisdom, the room to wrestle and to find ourselves and each other. May this be an image of you and the image of your vision of church here, among us, within us, and around us. This we give you thanks and praise in your many holy names. Amen. We invite the children to head downstairs for Jesus Vibes and celebration. series was inspired by a few conversations we had, both within our encounter series as well as our Wednesday night book discussions around good enough. We had questions about creeds and why don't we say them, because in church of some of our youth, we set a creed every Sunday. So what does this mean? Are we anti-creedal, non-creedal? What does all this mean? So Christianity has always been a creedal religion. It's rooted in the affirmations of faith found in Scripture that we handed out to our young ones today. These affirmations give focus to communities about the nature of God and what faith compels these communities to do. 
I am of the mind that creeds are not limited to just religion, but every group of humans create them, from nation states to the rotary. We have to say what we stand for and what we're about. We are also an image-driven species. We don't handle abstracts very well. We like concrete things. So this series is going to examine images of Jesus in art and creed. What images of Jesus we are assuming and what words of the ancient creeds that have shaped our understanding of God. For creeds, like art, come from a particular time and place. They are formed in a context from a people facing challenges and questions. When the United Church of Christ was formed, the founders stated that we were a non-creedal church. Sometimes this is mean to take in that we are anti-creedal. No creed but Christ was the cry of one of our ancestor denominations of the Christian church, who later merged with Congregationalists in the 1930s before forming the United Church of Christ in 1957. I would say that the disciples of Christ, as well as the Quakers, could be considered anti-creedal, and it is fine if some of you among us are as well. But non-creedal is not anti-creedal. Non-creedal means that the local church can select their own creed or catechism to confess whenever they see fit. Some local churches may want to print the Apostles' Creed each Sunday, some others the Nicene. Still others would, might choose to teach from the Heidelberg Catechism or the Westminster Confession or the Cambridge Platform of 1648 and not the 1688 heretics that we will have no quarter with. The creeds give us core values and tell the story of who we are as a people and frame how we see the world. Consider this historical credo from Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 9. You shall make of this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armean was my ancestor. He went down to Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried unto the Lord, the God of our ancestors. And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. When the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, God brought us to a place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This might have been a Hebrew third grade Bible presentation. Notice how it condenses Genesis and Exodus. Those stories condensed into an easily repeatable and memorable story of an entire nation encompassing two books of the Bible. We also remind ourselves of Peter's confession we read today in our call to worship. When Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you're the Christ. Peter is the first to name Jesus as Messiah, the chosen one of God, the Messiah being a human figure descended from David. God was not assumed to be the Messiah, but a person chosen by God. It is Thomas who first names Jesus as God, found in John 28, 20, 28. When shown the wounded hands and feet of Christ, Thomas says, My Lord and my God. And we get many in Paul's letters, especially the creed confessed in Romans chapter 8, how nothing in all of creation and beyond can separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus. Here are the creeds found right in Scripture. I find it interesting that there is no physical description of Jesus given in the New Testament. There is little, if any, description of the characters or the places in Scripture. The Gospels give us one time Jesus was made folks to sit down on the green grass found in Mark chapter 6, verse 39, a subtle echo of Psalm 23. I like how theologian Frederick Beekner writes, how the writers of the New Testament give no depiction of Jesus because it was his life inside of them that was the news that they told rather than the color of his eyes. Nobody can tell us what Jesus looked like. Yet, of course, the New Testament itself is what he looked like. And we read his face from there and in the faces of the ones he touched or failed to. You glimpse the mark of him in the faces of everyone who have ever looked toward him or away from him, which, of course, finally means that you glimpse the mark of him also 
in your face. One such popular rendering of Jesus is found right here in our church and on the cover of your bulletin. The American artist Werner Salman's Head of Christ, also called the Salman Head. It's by the chapel right over there, which I learned today that our Jesus Vibes folk call that the Jesus Room. All right, I get it. Werner Salman believed his initial sketch came from a miraculous vision at two in the morning in January of 1924. This vision was response that Salman prayed in a despairing situation. He got around to painting it in 1940 and it was picked up by a Baptist bookstore and made into a whole bunch of prints and started its dissemination to the masses. But it really picked up when it was handed out to every American serviceman heading off to overseas in World War II. If this is your image of Christ, great. It is very famous. It was, I believe, in my grandparents' home growing up and has been in the background of most of my life. Sometimes when I pray, I find myself picturing this Jesus when I'm at prayer. Many Lutherans and Roman Catholic Christians have praised the painting for the hidden messages that are in it. They find that right on the host, there is, right on this forehead, there's that circle of light that they say is the hidden host. And at his temple, the chalice in light, both symbols of communion. I've been 40 years old before I noticed that before. It took a Google search for me and a YouTube video saying, did you notice this? And I'm like, no. Yet a part of me also wrestles with this image because this is not what Middle Eastern people look like. This is not what Palestinians, Syrians, Egyptians, or Lebanese people look like. They look very different than this depiction, and this was the context Jesus was born into and formed by. Sometimes I jokingly call this American Jesus, Anglo Jesus, or World War II Jesus. But I still hold this painting in high esteem. While it can't be our only image of Jesus, however, so I caution us, with the second of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. We're in trouble. Whoops. Our Jewish and Muslim kindred follow this to the letter of the law. They use beautiful script and wonderful symbols, but never human depictions of the saints, and especially not of the divine. They take this commandment to heart as did our Protestant pioneers like Ulrich Zwingli, who smashed up the stained glass windows of his chapel in Zurich. And then to be made sure, he took the wooden statues of the saints and of Christ, chopped them up, and burned them, roasting sausages over them during Lent, just to make a point about idolatry. Ulrich Zwingli is my kind of guy. <laughs> kind of overstating the case, and I could always go for a good sausage even during Lent. So while I confess I might be breaking the second commandment, I also hold this image loosely. I find this image to be grounding and comforting. I really like the lighting of it. Jesus has a very subtle light around him, not an over-the-top halo that we find in Renaissance art. This Jesus feels like he's got his feet on the ground, unlike some other counter-reformation depictions of Jesus who is floating a few inches off the ground. Some people have light about them, a charisma they carry whenever they enter into the room. I think Jesus must have had that as his first disciples just dropped everything and followed them, followed him when he asked. I also like how Jesus is looking off to the side. What, what is he looking at over there? His vision is elsewhere. Maybe a reminder of the verse, my kingdom is not of this world, that Jesus said to Pontius Pilate during his trial. I wonder if in that vision he's seeing something we aren't. A vision where we have finally beaten our swords into plowshares and we don't learn war anymore. Maybe a vision of a world where every tear will be wiped away and death has lost its sting. A world where there are no outcasts only neighbors, and we have discovered that Christ 
In Christ there is no Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. It feels like, when I contemplate this image, the salmon head, a marked depiction of Christ, looking past the crowd and their expectations of him to some future goal, looking towards God's kingdom and where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. May this image provoke many theological questions as well as some hope and comfort in you because I don't believe those are bad things. I would love to hear your opinion on this painting following worship. Maybe visit the Salmon Head right there in the Jesus Room outside of our chapel. Consider how it makes you feel. I, for one, am excited to explore with you in this series and uncover more images and creeds. If you find one you like, awesome. If you find one you don't like, even better. Because in your discomfort, you can find new images, new ways of expression, new considerations, maybe of a God we've become too comfortable in our depictions of. Maybe, just maybe, we can take time and talk to our neighbor about the face of Christ we carry and the words we hold so dear. May God be with us in this coming journey. Thanks be to God, and amen. There's an offertory plate by the East Room and by the tower doors if you, feel, if you feel led to deposit your envelope or an offering there. You can also give through our Realm app or text to give, and that information's in your bulletin. Please join me for the offertory prayer. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together through what we offer 
through our time, talent, and treasure, hoping to build the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Let us rise in body or spirit and sing out our praise. Join me in the prayer of dedication. We sing to you, you are God. We shout joyfully to you, the rock of our salvation. We come before your presence with thanksgiving, and we raise to you our psalms and intentions for a better, more just world. In your many holy names we pray, amen. for your worship, your praise, and for our young scholars. Thank you for your presentations, both offered and silently offered up here. Spend some time with them, congregation. Check out all the art. There's a book. Published authors already. Can you believe it? That's you. That's you guys. Thank you for that. We want to remind our teams and committees, your annual reports are due on May 2nd, and our annual meeting on May 22nd, one service, 10 a.m., 
you won't want to miss it. The miles we covered in this year, we need a reminder. We've done a lot, and that is what has caused us to be the thriving community we are this day and going forward. We invite you to consider heading to Costa Rica to help build house number 198. We've built 197, about to embark on 198, but we need some people. So consider, if you got time, if you're freed up, a small trip to Costa Rica. This family that we're building for has been recently burgled. So most families start with little to nothing. This family is literally starting from nothing. And your help, whether through offerings on Mother's Day or the offering of your time and travel down to Costa Rica, is needed. Lots to consider. There's even more in your bulletins. But now, in your bulletin, please join me in the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, having been blessed to be a blessing. Go from here to bend the world towards blessing. Go, for this service is ended and our service now begins. Amen.